of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Hey folks, good to see you. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones and uh, welcome to this edition of the Act of Worship podcast. I'm trying something a little bit different today. I've never done this, but um, uh, with coronavirus going on right now, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, um, that I've seen, I'm seeing this as an opportunity to maybe reach people um, online a little bit more. And uh, so I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm actually going to sing, and uh, you're welcome to join in with me if you want. Um, But this is just kind of a moment of worship before we get into uh, what I'm going to discuss today, which is something theological, um, a biblical topic, uh, really just kind of a sermon almost, and uh, uh, very relevant to today as this is Palm Sunday, and just want the focus to be on Jesus Christ. Um, Without Him and without His words... I really have nothing to say, and so, um, so I want to try something a little bit different. As this is Palm Sunday, and we are reflecting on all the events that went in, uh, went on in the life of Christ that week, a little over two thousand years ago, and um, this is the day that we remember when Jesus rode into the city on a donkey, on a humble donkey, and uh, to loud shouts of Hosanna, and. Um, you know, no, no matter what you're doing today and the situations that we face, I'm having to remind myself of this constantly right now. Uh, it gets scary for a lot of people. Um, there's so much uncertainty, but we need to realize Jesus Christ is still God. He is still in control. And I'm going to talk about that a little later, but I want to uh, sing a song, and you're welcome to join in and sing if you want. And this one just proclaims him and says, Hosanna. Asking him to save us. So if you know this, you can sing along, but uh, this one's just called Hosanna.
Well, hello, and as I mentioned, uh, this is going to be a little bit different today. Um, here we are on Palm Sunday in, in a little bit of a different situation than we all would have expected, um, mainly because people are isolated. People are social distancing, and um, most churches are not meeting today. If you are, then more power to you, but... Um, um, most people are having some sort of gathering online or something like that. They are adapting to the situation. Um, and so, you know, I thought this would be a good opportunity to maybe help out in that endeavor. And so um, um, here we are on Palm Sunday. And so I want to talk about Palm Sunday. Um, I want to try to do more theological topics, more biblical uh, topics, and discuss these matters and look at Scripture. Uh, really, apart from the Word of God, I have nothing to say. And so... Uh, that is our guide here on earth. And so we begin this Holy Week really in a different way than we've ever experienced. And uh, I think this this will go on in through Resurrection Sunday to begin the Easter season, uh, social distanced from others. And uh, But we need to remember that Jesus reigns supreme, that he sits on his throne at the right hand of the Father, and uh, that he's still in control. And, you know, Holy Week is really a vital time in the gospel narratives because the events of that week uh, comprise nearly a third of the material of the gospels. There is a lot that went on in Jesus' ministry on earth, but Holy Week proves to be crucial to the Christian understanding of who he is. Both the humility and the lordship of Jesus is reflected in the events of Holy Week. And so um, I'm going to look at one of those accounts from Matthew's gospel. And it gives us a glimpse not only into Jesus, but his followers as well, including us, because I think we can relate to this in many ways. Um, and it tells a narrative of practical atheism. And so we're going to talk, talk about, I'm going to talk about practical atheism in Holy Week. And what's meant by the term practical atheism is the practice of claiming who Jesus is, declaring that, that he's God, and yet living in a vastly disparate manner. And certainly all believers have done this to some extent and some point and probably still do. Um, if the Apostle Peter could do it, then I think we are likely to do it as well. But... Jesus continues to love and nurture his people as he did on that day and even afterwards. I um, mean, he did that for the people that uh, cried Hosanna and then later would, would crucify him. And so I'm going to look at Matthew 21, 6 through 11. And uh, we, we understand this account. We know now that uh, Jesus would be crucified later, but... There are three vivid elements in this narrative that pop out to me uh, when I'm talking about practical atheism. And so this might be examined from a different viewpoint than most people are, are used to. So uh, let me read the passage. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is Matthew 21, 6 through 11. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them out on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Uh, Galilee. So, we know that many of us are familiar with this narrative. Jesus rides into the city on a donkey, uh, probably <laughs> no more humble animal than that, and uh, crowds are praising him, lauding him, Hosanna in the highest. And yet we also know that later they would crucify him, many of the same people. And I see three aspects from this story that I think we can all relate to of how we um, employ practical atheism in our lives. We say we believe in God. We say we believe who God is, who Jesus is, but then we do something completely different in the way we live our lives. And, um, you know, people may think, well, that's reading into it too much. No, I, I do, uh, live my life, uh, believing that Jesus is God, that he's Lord, that he's in control. Let me give you three ways we don't do this. 
Number one, we profess who Jesus is, but we don't live in the same way. And the, the, the crowds here professed who Jesus is. Make no mistake, they did that. They declared him as the son of David in verse 9 with their lips. And they praised him as Lord only to deny him later that same week. The, cr- the crowd accurately shouted and with joy who Jesus is, that he is blessed. He's the son of David. He comes in the name of the Lord. He's the prophet Jesus of Nazareth. They declared all of these things. But they did not carry it far enough. We know that these same people would crucify him later. And this act might certainly be reflective, I think, of our own lives. While we might criticize these people, but if we, if we place ourselves in their situation, it won't take long for us to realize that we would likely do the same because we've failed Jesus, we've denied him, and we have even proclaimed who he is only to live life in a drastically different way later. And so I refer to this as practical atheism, Because deep down, we probably do believe that Jesus is God. And although Christians claim to believe in Jesus and who he is, it's easy and it's often that believers do not allow that proclamation to be realized in action. In other words, a radically changed life. All believers, I think, are guilty of this contradictory way of living to some degree. And so as Christ changes us, the hope and the prayer should be that those contradictions diminish and that hypocrisy vanishes in our lives. C.S. Lewis uh, famously uses his trilemma in mere Christianity. He asks if Jesus is a liar or a lunatic, because if he's neither, he's precisely who he says he is. He's Lord. In other words, what, what humans do with Jesus is of utmost importance. Uh, There's a lot of focus right now on COVID-19, and probably rightly so, but um, I still say it's overblown, but uh, uh, irrespective of that, um, there's a lot of focus on it, and there should be, at all times, no matter what is going on, more focus on what people do with Jesus Christ. That is the single most important question of anyone's life. And so to accurately proclaim who Jesus is, is to concurrently claim that your life will reflect that truth. While human nature is to, is, is to do as the crowd did that first day of Holy Week and proclaim who he is, but then live differently, Jesus' radical transformation in the lives of his people should bring gospel clarity from not only what the church preaches, but also how the church lives. So that's number one, how we engage in practical atheism. We profess who Jesus is, but we don't live in the same way. Number two, we minimize Jesus. The crowd minimized Jesus. They minimized him to an earthly warrior who would save with violence as a mere prophet. Now, now hear me on this, okay? He is certainly a prophet. And there will be a day when he will return with vengeance in his eyes. But while he was certainly a prophet, he is also more. The crowd failed to realize this. While Jesus certainly could destroy humanity with a mere word, this is not the type of Messiah he is. Proclaiming him as this was a minimization by these people. And we often treat Jesus in a similar manner by proclaiming him as a genie (laughs) and a wish granter. And, And so to believe him... As this, as a genie, as a wish granter, is to effectively neglect who he truly is, God and worthy of total devotion. Jesus proclaims himself as God. Millions of believers throughout history have given their lives on his behalf, and Jesus lives today with supreme authority. So, how dare we minimize him to someone who exists to serve our petty wants and desires? And yes, that's what they are. And so as the crowd was looking for a military hero, they missed the point of who Jesus is. And we also employ practical atheism by neglecting to reveal to the world the awe and the might of Jesus. People have this idea of Jesus as this weak man who is not the almighty God and creator of the universe and who is not all about his own glory. He is. Jesus does not exist to accept you as you are, and he won't accept you as you are because his glory is too, is too valuable to himself to do so. 
And that may sound like something strange because you might not have ever been told that. Uh, But hear me out. He will reach you where you are and he will reach anyone where they are and nurture them in conforming them to his own image. So to think that Jesus exists for people is to minimize him. Believers need to realize that Jesus is God and co-equal with the Father and the Spirit and therefore as worthy of total devotion. So that's the second way we engage in practical atheism. We uh, minimize Jesus. The third way is we claim Jesus' salvation for anyone and everyone with our lips, but we we deny it with our lives. Part of the problem with the crowd that first Palm Sunday was a misunderstanding of Jesus. They wanted a military leader to rescue them from earthly dictators. And just as they did, Christians now, we often seek Jesus out of selfish motivations. And so when the crowd cried, Hosanna, they were literally asking Jesus to save them. That's what that word means. Evidently, Psalm 118 was used in the crowd's praise that day, and and some also infer that it will be used at his second coming. Read Matthew 23, 39 for that. Uh, This cry of salvation, Hosanna, that means save now, this cry of salvation was a genuine plea from an oppressed people, but Jesus' aim was larger and bigger than much uh, than mere earthly victories because his purpose is eternal. And so when Christians face trials, it needs to be remembered that God's eternal purpose is bigger than mere momentary pleasures and even than the limited time on this planet. Certainly we have a purpose on this planet, but it's an eternal purpose. We are eternal beings created with eternal souls. And so when we neglect to realize the eternal kingdom purpose of God, Jesus is minimized. And people might wonder how the crowd could hail Jesus and then crucify him a few days later. But this is done in action for many Christians still. And we all probably at some point have done it and still do it. This often plays out, uh, let me give you an example, in discounting certain people in God's salvation. Perhaps there's someone who has committed a heinous act or wronged someone so extremely that the general population, maybe even the general population of the church, feels indignation toward that person. And a common attitude seems to be, even after professing that Jesus can save anyone, we often say that, right? Jesus can save anyone. But the common attitude is that that person is beyond hope. We won't say it out loud, but deep down we think, oh, that person's hopeless. Or we might even want them to burn in hell. What a terrible thing, but sometimes we want that. How dare that person commit that act? I'll let you use your imagination, whatever that act may be. How dare that person do that? They deserve to burn in hell. Well, we all deserve to burn in hell. But not only should believers proclaim that Jesus can save anyone, but we should also, okay, let's take it a step further. Here's here's how this plays out. We often say, Jesus can save anyone. And maybe deep down we believe it. But then we treat these people who have done something so extremely wrong with indignation, okay? Animosity. We treat them terribly. And... So And we, we, we do that because we think they deserve it, and they probably do, but we do also. And so we do that. Deep, deep down, that's practical atheism. That is saying one thing and living another. So why don't we take it a step further? Not only say it, not only believe it, but when we proclaim that Jesus can save such a person, we should also treat that person with the love of Christ as Jesus commanded. Think about this. The church utterly rejected Jesus, and yet he loved us and died for us. Why should we not do the same as difficult as it is? And when you have a hard time loving someone because of something they did, as terrible as it might be, whatever they did, consider how Jesus treated us. It's the same situation, but probably even a hundredfold. When we fail to do this, we minimize Jesus to someone who saves only those who are humanly worthy of his salvation, when ironically, no such person exists, because we're all equally flawed. And so to cry out, Hosanna, save now, is to believe that Jesus can save anyone and to love everyone, that means we love everyone as Jesus does. 
And so these three things stick out to me from this passage. In many ways, we can relate to this crowd because we profess who Jesus is, but we don't live the same way. We minimize Jesus and we claim Jesus' salvation for anyone with our lips, but we deny it with our, our, our lives. And so the final thing here is when we realize God's eternal glory, we eliminate minimization. We, Christians often lose sight of who Jesus is, but this happens when the focus on God's glory is lost. Think about Peter walking on the water when he, you know, you've heard the story and he lost focus and he began to sink. God's purposes are larger than anything done in this life and on this earth. In fact, life on earth serves as merely a part of eternal glory. And so when believers view Jesus as someone who exists primarily to serve them, to serve people, rather than us to serve him, he is minimized to less than who he is, less than God. He is, however, God himself, and he exists to serve his own purposes. Some of you might say, well, that sounds like he's conceited, that that God is all about himself. He is all about himself, always has been, always will be. And even in his mediation and his intercession on behalf of his bequeathed people, Jesus should not be minimized to a human-serving wish-granter. The crowd that first Palm Sunday rightly proclaimed Jesus as who he is, but they fell short of realizing his eternal purpose. And so their praise did not extend beyond that day because although surely a part of God's plan, (laughs) um, they would have him crucified later that week. Yes, that was a part of God's plan, but part of his plan was them failing to realize who he is. And so this Palm Sunday today, While the circumstances are vastly different than probably what we've ever experienced, let us proclaim Jesus as Lord and not only do that, but to refuse practical atheism by living what we claim to believe, namely that Jesus is God and he is worthy of total devotion. Thanks for being with me today on the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones.